the goal of all of this is to help you understand how these gentlemen are using direct mail and some unique uh, layered direct mail to get some impressive ROI. And we want to help you understand how they're doing it, why they think about the world the way they do, and help unlock some new strategies and tactics that you can all start to apply to your businesses. So I'm going to start with Andrew Edinger. If I could bring Andrew on stage. Andrew has got a very unique story. In fact, I came across this article recently about Andrew talking about how uh, as a former financial guru, his story took him from bankruptcy to now CEO of one of the largest direct mail companies, which is intriguing. And so Andrew, how the heck did you decide to jump into print of all things and direct mail? Give us kind of the arc of your story and how you got to where you are today. I appreciate you having me on here. At the age of 26, I was probably one of the youngest senior vice presidents at Morgan Stanley. I've been recruited over from Prudential Securities. I had $200 million in the management. If everybody remembers the 2000 and the market boom, and I was a genius. There was nobody smarter than I was. I was going out, partying like a rock star, picked up some bad habits to be perfectly blunt with myself. I'd become a drug addict. I was dating the wrong women. 2001 came and it was a harsh reality. The money that I had under management was my family's, was my friends. So the market crashed and I just figured, hey, two more months, I'll make the money back. That's not what happened. Not only did I go from being a millionaire many times over at the age of 26 to being literally homeless, having lost money for all my friends and my family. And it was truly humbling. And in 2004, I moved to Connecticut and I lived on my partner's couch for seven years. I filed for bankruptcy. You can't file for bankruptcy from your family and your friends. So I paid back every single dime. It took me 10 years. I paid back every single dime. It turned me from really a jackass to someone who's like the appreciation that I could possibly have for everything now it has just changed so much. The saddest part about it was that my mother passed away in 2010. And that's just when I had started to turn the curve. Wow. And so I've lived with the guilt. My mother seeing me as as not who I am today, where I'm married with a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I love what I do. I have no personal materialistic needs besides my house for my kids and for my wife. I wear the same sweatpants that I wore five years ago when I was broke. I wear the same t-shirt that I wore five years ago when I was broke. And like I said, there was it didn't seem like there was ever going to be a light at the tunnel. For, for 10 years, I walked up and down the streets of Connecticut, knocking on business owners' doors, getting them to advertise in a shared magazine, which allowed me to deal with over 500 different business types 500 times over. So getting that experience and understanding who the good businessmen went, what the good markets are, who the bad businessmen were. And it's brought me to where I am today, owning my own company and being able to help other contractors with the experience that I've gained over the last 20 years. How did you get into print? How did that happen? Well, my partner owned a chain of four pizza restaurants and they were actually going around and they were handing out flyers door to door. 20 people handing out flyers door to door. I remember I was making $9 an hour at the time. I wasn't a partner. And until we realized that you can actually print and mail something cheaper than you can actually go door to door and put a door hanger onto the home. So it was his idea initially to to start up a shared mail magazine. And I was his gun. Like he just pointed and shoot and I would go and I would open accounts it was you know, probably in about 2015 I kind of got not bored with the shared mail idea it's just that I wasn't making a difference in in people's lives there was no way to analytically see the difference that I was making so about 10 of us I've been the most incredible team in the world the business would not be in existence without them I I can honestly say that without them I I would have no company I don't want to leave anybody out from Ashley Sanborn to Ann Hogan to Louis Janusa to Chris Wetmore to Ashley Broussard, to Gina and Agnes, just they're all family to me. As we became more successful, then COVID obviously hit in and it knocked us off. We were mailing for one of the largest national fitness retailers in the country, 100 million pieces a year. We weren't we weren't diversified. And then when that when that carpet got pulled out from us, it was 
life altering. And I read an article in a Harvard paper and it said like, you can go into survival mode or you can go into expansion mode. This is where new companies come and become the behemoths of this time. You can go into micromanagement mode or empowering mode. And the third part that really got me was find your niche marketing. Don't be where everybody else is. Let's use that opportunity, Drew, to introduce Tom. He's the CEO of Griffin Service. And Tom, I'd love to have you just share a little bit about your story, your business, and what brings you to today's session. I'm a third generation SOB, son of a boss. So I grew up in the business. Some people think that stands for something else. That's their problem, not mine. I have a a company I own and operate in Connecticut called Climate Partners. I have a company I own and operate in Florida called Griffin Service. Both are in the home service space, HVAC, plumbing, stuff like that. I've owned other businesses on the East Coast. I've started and sold franchises. And so I've got a lot of experience in the trade. Grew up in it. It's in my DNA. I love it. I go to sleep thinking about it. I wake up thinking about it. I am one of those guys who would fall into the category of, I love what I do. It's not easy. It's a grind. It's hard. It, it, there, there's challenges being in the retail or the, the, the residential service space. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I took a year off from college to work with my dad. And here I am 38 years later, still on my year off. I wouldn't have it any other way. So um, done a lot of things through my career. Been on the commercial side, B2B. Been on the, the B2C side. Currently, our businesses are more B2C. We do more um, residential than commercial. Similar to Drew, I had sold my first contracting business back in 2000 at the time when the industry was consolidating and quite an experience. And I, I rode the wave up and I rode the wave down when the stock market crashed. And, and I kind of learned at that point that I really liked dealing with people who could write checks and make decisions as customers. Hmm. So I kind of moved more to the B2C side and even the B2B side where we probably do less national accounts less giant things like commercial builders and stuff. So in my businesses, we specialize in not construction. So we're not doing new home builders. We're doing existing structures, existing homeowners, existing building owners, servicing them, replacing their equipment, upgrading, enhancing, things like that. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here, Tom. Thank you for making time for the community. And uh, let's bring to the stage here your friend and that you guys like to rib each other a little bit. So hopefully some of that uh, humor comes out during today's session. We have Lou Habaika who's here. Welcome to the show, Lou. And love for you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your story as well. Hey, sure thing, Dave. Thanks for having me on and mind fire audience. Thanks for being here. So uh, I'm certain uh, the three of us will be able to share some really good gold nuggets with you today. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I'm a second generation SO as Tom would say. Started back with my father. He was a, a Lebanese immigrant, came here in the early 20s, served for our country in the army and under the GI Bill, studied refrigeration and business, started his own company, Hobika's Refrigeration 1952, and wow. primarily was a refrigeration company. In the little city that I operate and live in here is Phoenix, Arizona. It started to grow from 30,000 and just started to blow up. So a city blows up, comes a hot oven, all that heat effect and air conditioning grew. So no different than today, our most uh, sought after resource is finding team members, employees, recruits, apprentices, skilled labor. And my dad had the same problem. So couldn't find people. And uh, him and my mom went to work and figured they'd just make their own employees. So had seven kids. We all, we all worked in the business, right? So I, I've been in the business my entire life. We're talking helpers, sheet metal fab, addicts, installation service, you name it, every aspect. Went to college. I got a business degree. My brother, Paul, got an engineering degree. We bought the business in 1989. So we've owned it for 32 years. And primarily Hobika Services, we transitioned our name in 2000 from Hawaii Refrigeration to services because we started to bring on additional services. So we mainly provide residential home service and air conditioning, heating, plumbing, drain, sewer, water conditioning, filtration, electrical services, uh, wine cellar. So that's a nice little niche. And some people will say, well, what do you get out of wine cellars? Well, it's, it's not a big market area. It brings about five, six hundred thousand dollars of revenue. And a wine cellar customer is our perfect, perfect customer. And as Jared Andrew mentioned before, owning the home, that's our primary goal to own the home with everything that we do and offer. And a wine cellar customer, what do they typically have? They typically have money, right? They have an expensive hobby. They have a big home with lots of air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, water needs, security needs. We provide all of that and we become their preferred partner. We are the most likable 
people you'll ever meet. You'll like them. So they like us. Yeah, they like us. They trust us and they want to utilize us. And that's really what it's out for. So that's my story. And as we move on, I can get into why direct mail is a important part of my marketing and communicating my brand. Well, what I want to do, uh, it's interesting you mentioned own the home. And uh, for everybody who's here, I had an opportunity yesterday to uh, join Drew with with some of his clients and just listen in on a mastermind uh, that they hold once a month, which I think is really an interesting strategy. And I'd love for you, Drew, just for very briefly here, uh, kind of walk us through a bit of what it is that Lou and Tom and your clients get from you in terms of direct mail. Also, let's talk a little bit about digital and your view there. So here on the screen, which everyone should be able to see, uh, drop a one in the chat. Just make sure we're all connected. Drop a one if you can see these examples here. Uh, these are some emails uh, that, that you do in addition to the direct mail services that you provide your clients. So Drew, tell us, tell us a little bit about these and what we're looking at here. What we're looking at is these would typically be uh, a 13 by 12 and a half piece that'll fold into a 13 by six and a quarter. It's strategically done that way so that when it folds into the mail, it's technically will be the largest unfolded piece of mail in your mailbox. So the typical length and height of a single family home is 13 inches long and six and a half inches high. It's strategically made that way. We're constantly updating our artwork. We, we don't have templated artwork. You referred to that Zoom meeting. We like to do as a company is, our company is like an ecosystem. We invite all of our people to be able to rely on each other to grab ideas to find out what's working in their marketplaces. We do something maybe a little bit different where we offer market exclusivity on uh, not just where you mail to, also where you think you might expand to. We don't want anybody to get blocked in. It's all about partnerships. It's not the only vertical that we're in. These are both older HVAC guys experienced than to the best out there. And they help us make the pieces and give us the ideas and help us with the services and not just Lou and Tom, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 other people. We probably have over 350, 400 home service clients, a couple hundred home improvement clients. Everybody who runs with us runs typically a monthly basis and nobody's on contract and we have a 97% retention ratio. So tell us what we're looking at here on the screen. When we talked initially, we were really talking about how you partner and create the this ecosystem of support for your clients. And that's a very, very important part of the puzzle. I'm sure that your clients are also saying at the end of the day, it's about return on investment and I got to show me the money, right? So tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here on the screen and how you use this to uh, demonstrate that value to your clients. So really interesting. This would, if I can go back, this is kind of like your end result. The beginning of the result, the, the way a conversation would start with our clients, because our clients are ultimately going to be our partners. We're invested, we're in 24-7. We're available anytime. There's no time that anybody's going to ever call you or email us and not get a, a reply. A typical conversation is I'm going to ask the client, I'm going to ask the prospective client, what did you do in revenue? What did you do in revenue last year? What percentage of your advertising are you spending on ad per, for your revenue? I'm going to ask them where they're putting their money. I'm going to ask them where their techs are. And I'm going to ask them what their goals are. And typically someone's going to say, "What? Well, okay, so what are you going to propose? We have nothing to propose to you. What I'm going to propose is how about you send me your last two years customer client list and I'm going to plot that out for you on a 3D heat map. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 3D heat map and we're going to do a go-to meeting and I'm going to show you where your clients are coming from. I'm going to show you where they're not coming from. I'm going to show you the saturation of the carry route. And the carry route, anybody who doesn't know, is the zip code and breaking it down into the individual routes that your mailman will walk in a, a given day anywhere between three to 500 homes. And we're going to append data to it. We're going to append income and home values. And we're going to show you from an area level and a street level, we're going to come down to the street level so we can show you the bars. And it can, when every client is plotted out, you can actually see how many times that clients come back to you. Because a lot of times I'll have a conversation with a client and they'll say, oh, we have a great retention ratio. We're like, we don't need to mail to our existing clients. Lou and Tom have, have, are going to have theories on this that I want to pass on to them on that. So I don't want to touch on that. And I say, oh, okay. So send me your last two years customer list. And Send me your last five-year customer list. So your last five-year customer list has 25,000 people on it. And your last two-year customer list has 4,000 people on it. What happened to the other 21,000 people? So then we are able to use the information that we gather 
to do a couple things. One is we can find your avatar and find it in other places. And we can do it in, in a couple of different ways, a radius to your location, zip codes that you want to hit, or maybe based on saturation of carrier routes that you might find that I'm performing so well in that carrier route that those are the carrier routes that I want to go after. So everything is based on data and analytics. I can't make a proposal to a client until we've reviewed all this data, until what makes sense for them. And then at the end of the day, what we're going to do is 95% of our clients give us access to their CRMs. So this right here is uh, what we call a matchback report, because in this day and age, the internet is a hub. It's a toll booth. There's no avoiding it. 90% of people who are going to use Lou's product or use Tom's product are going to Google their name of their company into the Google box before they make a phone call. So call tracking is just merely like a mechanism for pe for, for for the consumer, for the, the end business client to, to feel like calls are coming in. What we do is we take every single address and we do this every three months for every client and we match them back to every single mailer that they sent out over the last three months. And when we go six months, we go back six months because direct mail has a shelf life, which is unique. And so we can go back and we, we can tell them, this is how much money that you spent on your total clients. This is how many clients you got. This is how many clients said that this is what they spent on their first visit. Now, after, after the first visit, they're going to move over to their existing client list. We can just show them what they spent, the return on their investment for the first client, the first client visit. And we can do that for their prospect mailers, for their existing client mailers, for their radius mailers. I saw mailers. somebody say that they love the way that you are able to get into the mapping and that you're using data to prove the value of mails. So I just wanted to yeah, pass that. I want to say that these reports that I give are, are going to be a hundred percent accurate. You know, like there's still going to be people doing pay-per-click and they're going to acquire things. All of our data is based on when the mail went out and when the client, there's going to be the, the always is going to be the discussion like on current clients, current clients are always going to perform the best. I can't take credit for current clients. I hope that when I do a mailer to the current clients, that it increases the response rate or triggers a thought in their mind. Right. Let's bring Tom and Lou now to uh, help us dig in a little bit deeper here. And as the community has submitted Lou and Tom numerous questions, hundreds and hundreds of questions. And what we did is we went through and tried to find the ones that were most demonstrative or representative of what the community is looking for. And so folks, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through those questions. I'm going to ask Lou and Tom and Drew to uh, give their two cents on each and we're going to try to make it through as many as we can here if they say something like i saw drew somebody ask you asked you what is the shelf life for direct mail i think you said six months in your view is that right is that kind of how you see it if, if something like that comes up folks just throw it in the chat we'll make sure to try to answer all the questions that you have as we go through this so first question up here i'm gonna i'm gonna address this one to you lou we got a lot of uh, questions like this we don't use direct mail where would you recommend starting the process what kind of budget should we allocate for something like this so lou let me throw that one at you first how do you see this um, from your perspective yeah so that's a really good question i'm gonna say three years ago i totally stopped pay-per-click i just wasn't seeing the return on investment and i wasn't able to market my brand and i'm all about marketing my brand we're memorable our reputation what we look like so when, when i look at marketing website any type of a piece i always look for what and why i mean contractors like us most every contractor is pretty good at marketing communicating their what product services what you're providing what you're doing the why why would i choose Hobica services. Mm -hmm. What about Hobica attracts me? Why would I want to use these guys? Are they trustworthy? Do I feel good about them? Do they have a good reputation? So communicating that why I'm ever, I'm able to better communicate that why through direct mail. And that's not just a monthly mailer. It expands beyond that. So to answer your basic question, first of all, how much would I direct how much money would I put towards direct mail? 30% uh, of my marketing budget is direct mail of some sort. And I have five or six, maybe seven different areas that I would qualify as direct mail. I'm a really good mail processor. You go to the mailbox, you pull your mail, and I'm a left-hand, right-hand trash can. I can process things really, really good. And I'm only going to keep the things that I need or that attract my attention or are bigger or more memorable 
will stick out. Maybe there's something in it, and I can talk about this later, that I feel there may be something hidden or important inside. So it creates an interest for me to have to open it. So that's like a, a positive open rate, and that's what we want. We just want to be seen. It's really about consistency and with direct mail, however you're approaching it. And I can explain a number of different methods as we go on that I cross-pollinate my direct mail. It's timing. So you have to be consistent. And sure, left-hand, right-hand traffic can I may throw it away five, six, seven times. The timing and being memorable is important because there is a time when I or consumers or prospects are going to need my services. One of them. It's not, it's not if they're ever going to need them. They it's are right. definite, right? Yep. Your AC will fail. They mm-hmm. will have a water leak. They'll have water damage. Their sewer, their drain, their toilet's going to plug up. They're yep. going to have electrical issues. So all of that comes to play. You have to be there when the timing is right. And then that's when things happen. So we can get into offers and what works well with coupons and BOGOs and things like that, seasonal. I want to give Tom a chance to answer this. One follow-up for you, Lou. What percent of your overall revenue do you allocate to marketing? 10%. 10%, 10% of total revenue is allocated to marketing. And then about a third of that is allocated to DM. Yes. What's the other two thirds allocated to? Employee marketing. I market to my ah. team members. So the best and most powerful ambassadors I have are my team members, right? So I heavily compensate, spiff, incentivize them to be able to market our company. And then I do the same with my customer base. They're my second best, most powerful ambassador. Billboards, that's expensive. TV, radio, that gets really expensive. So there's a number of other mediums. It all wraps into, this is just part of how I communicate my brand, my why. That's fascinating. Tom, what are your thoughts on this question? Somebody who says, I don't use direct mail. Where do I start? What kind of budget? What problem are we really trying to solve, guy? So where do I start is what am I trying to get for my marketing? And that for me would start with my overall budget and business plan. What are we trying to accomplish? For me to go down to the how many phone calls do I need to receive level? And so as long as as my number of calls I have to generate, then I would go and look at my marketing. I look at it as an investment portfolio. I refer Hmm. to it as my marketing portfolio. And in my investment portfolio, I don't have all tech or all services. I have I have a spread of investments to share the risk. Well, in my marketing approach, it's I'm investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I want to share the risk. More appropriately than the risk, how I look at it and how to answer this question is, how do I integrate and stack my investment? So if I'm going to do direct mail, how does it interlock to my social media? How does it interlock to my web presence? How does it interlock to my truck wraps, my uniforms? Everything I do should be lifting up the whole. So the first place is understanding that to me. So if someone asks me, I say, well, what's your budget? How many calls do you need to generate? And where do you think they're coming from? Most common answer is called the hope and pray method. They go, I hope the phone <laughs> rings. I pray the phone rings. There's no actual way to generate it. And, and that's unfortunate. It's all too common in, I think, home services. From a budget perspective, if, if you're in the range where Lou is, that 10 to 12%, that would generally be a growth budget. I'm trying to acquire customers. I'm being aggressive. I want to grow my business. In a non-growth sort of maintained budget, you're probably in the range of five to 6% of total revenue for your budget. And then I would agree with Lou, about 30 to 35% of the overall budget would be allocated to direct mail in my case. Again, in a balanced portfolio, nothing would probably be more than about a third of the overall budget because I want to spread and and stack my risk. In my companies in Connecticut, it's a more mature business. It's a different type of marketplace. So we run about 6% marketing expense. In Florida, we're four years old. We're growing very rapidly. We spend about 10 percent of revenue on marketing. So McKinsey, what are your thoughts on that? You talk to a lot of folks that are using direct mail and other channels. And by the way, I see those questions coming in around what other channels do Tom and Lou incorporate? What are your thoughts, Mac? Yeah, so I'm going to answer my thoughts and then I'm actually going to ask a question to Tom and Lou just kind of as a follow-up. I think that the biggest takeaway that I have here in the way that I answer this question is find a partner or someone who can actually talk you through these things. I mean, as I hear Lou and Tom talk, you are business owners, you're marketers, right? You're thinking about your business and how do I reverse engineer the call volume I need to tell me how much I need to spend? How do I find my audience? How do I, a huge takeaway, Lou, is how do I communicate my why, right? These are all things that many 
business owners that I talk to aren't thinking in those terms. They're not, they don't have their marketer glasses on. And so my question, and I think it's kind of follows up to this, if there, if someone's just starting out and they don't have that marketing expertise, we'll call it, how did you become a marketer? How did you start to think in these ways beyond just, this is what I do. And this is the revenue that I want to generate that got you to a place where you can even start to look at direct mail and the results as, wow, this is impacting my business. I'll take that question. You know a couple of different perspectives. Number one, Andrew could probably tell you stories. Him and I locked horns for a long time on having different points of view. And, and in all fairness, he proved me wrong and he taught me to look at things differently. Now, as I've kind of, my dad always had an expression, don't put your ego in front of your wallet. And so if you do that kind of mm. thinking, like I'm going to think about this financially, and I'm going to, I like your term, Mac, reverse engineer. What I do is really simple. I go buy coffee for my customers a couple times a month, and I just ask them questions. And I, I say, how do you make decisions? What's the factor? For example, you say uh, a question I would ask, like not naming Griffin Services or Climate Partners, can you tell me three HVAC guys who most people can't even name one HVAC guy? We think we're like top of mind. <laughs> they couldn't care less about us. And plumbers is even less. And so I go, well, if you don't know any guys to call, how do you make a decision? And they'll tell you, I go to social media, I call my friends. Then I go to Google. Google third. Then I type plumber near me. Well, then you have this whole list of people. How do you decide? And the most common answer to me was I recognize a name. Okay. That's important information. How do you recognize a name? Well, I've seen their trucks. I've got mail from, I saw the billboards. It's not Google generating the lead because they have to pick from this list. So then I said, well, well, how do you like to get information? Is it email? Is it text? And they go, I like mail. And I like to do it on my terms. I don't want to be disrupted by like Facebook ads flashing across or whatever. But that's how I've done it, Mac. I just literally talk to people and they'll tell you. If somebody calls, people have called to complain about our ads. And I call up and I go, well, what didn't you like about it? People have said, I love your ads. I call up and say, what do you love about it? So a real big secret, ask the people who are calling why they call. Talk to your customers, talk to your clients. Lou, did you want to add something on there? How'd you become a marketer? How did you gain these insights and actually begin to internalize them to grow your business? Yeah, so th that's a good question. I, I don't know that I would consider myself a marketer. I'm just really good at communicating my brand. So basically, your why. You have to determine, sit down and figure out who you are, what you stand for, and what you want to communicate with who you are, what you're providing, right? So, and then be consistent with that with everything you do. Being memorable, being a little bit silly, just being human, that, that's really important. So if this was a complicated, a really smart guy business, I guarantee I wouldn't do well at it. Yeah. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, right? I'm just a real guy that uses common sense. That's all you have to be a real person. You use common sense and put your consumer hat on. What do you as a consumer, what would your prospective consumers are existing? What would they want? Right. And for me, it's all about likability. So our tagline jingle, you'll like a Hobika. I won't sing for you. You'll like a Hobika. And we communicate, we're, we are the most likable people you'll ever meet. So what people really want as a home service provider, they own this big home with all this great stuff. They don't know how to take care of it and they don't want to. They want someone to take care of it for them. Most importantly, they want somebody they can trust that they know is going to be doing the right thing even when nobody's watching. And a multi-service provider in owning the home, that's huge for them. So it's all about relationship, defining, communicating your brand consistently. And uh, it's not rocket science. It's just, just be human. You're getting many requests to go ahead and sing the jingle. I think you should sing it too, Lou. Let's hear it. Come on, man. <laughs> I do not have a singing voice. That's okay. I need some music in the background. I don't have it. You like a Hobika, bike, <laughs> you'll like that Hobika services, Hobika services, Hobika service for you. All right. Love Give it. some love in the hey. chat there, folks. Facebook, LinkedIn, Zoom. That's silly. It's memorable. That's who we are. We're just <laughs> real human. And that's what people like. That's awesome. Well, we have a bunch of questions coming in around the, the, the idea of what other channels are you using in addition to direct mail or what other channels are you folks using to support the direct mail. And so I want to get into that. And I think this question here from Robert is a good segue with social media and the internet. Does direct mail really still work? Uh, so let me throw that first over to you, Lou, since you just made an impression on everyone with your singing talent. Does it really still work compared to digital? How is that possible? Let me put it in a different perspective, just like team members. So appreciating your employees, right? So people come to work and they work for you, your company, my company to be able to earn money and make a living, right? So that that will get them here. That won't keep them here. 
right? In order to keep them here, you need to do a lot more. So it's recognition, it's support, it's a drive, it's keeping things exciting, fun, motivating, moving forward, being part of something bigger than yourself. So direct mail is part of that whole scheme. It's just part of the whole mix of how you're communicating your brand. There still is nothing better than a physical piece of marketing in your hand. You can touch, feel, see. You can't get that through anything electronic. It's not the same. It's here, it's gone, and you forgot all about it. The direct mail piece, it may stick around for a little while, especially if it has something that you may need at that time or may need in the future. And on top of direct mail, so with Andrew, we'll sit, I send consistently to prospects and my customer base a direct mail piece every month. And then immediately following that piece, piece is an e-card. So an electronic card by email as well. We then follow up after every in-home service visit. You had it up before with a thank you card. So we actually send a handwritten, personalized, well, it's not handwritten, electronically written, personalized, dear David, thank you so much for your trust and confidence in our services, blah, blah, blah. And we include a $50 comeback card and fast pass. So basically $50 off any future service they could use from us and a fast pass to move to the front of the line guaranteed same day service. So that type of a thing. I chose eight different types of installs that we do. Could be HVAC, electric panel, could be drain sewer, reline, could be insulation, water heater, water conditioning, wine cellar. So a lot of different stuff we will send after every install to 150 surrounding homes, this piece. And it'll have an offer of a free inspection for that related service and a $50 off coupon. We're trying to concentrate and not only own the home, my goal is to, I choose a zip code and it has to do with the the value of the home and the income of the household. And I look to own that zip code. So we're there, our vans are there. We have a yard sign program that works great with banners related to each service that we provide. We get the customer to agree to put a yard sign in their yard for two weeks. We give them $50 off the job. The tech that sells it, it's $25 spiff. So that's how it works. We pay people to get things done. Kind of like rocket science, right? So the thank you card, <laughs> that's a big deal. If I go to look at, I have two types of marketing. We have prospects for new customers and I have existing customers. I actually, since I have so many services that I offer that my customers or prospects would need, I market to my existing existing customer base, I'm going to say 50 to 60% of my marketing budget is to my existing customers. Because, so, I mean, we look at labor. Labor is our our most, most highly sought after and expensive commodity. So in my business, every dollar of labor carries with it $3.50 $3.50 of overhead, right? So I want to maximize my labor, my visit in the home with all the services we offer. Tom, how would you answer this question? Digital, uh, social media? I mean, that's everywhere, right? We see we see Facebook's revenues, we see Google's revenues, everything's digital. How the heck does direct mail still work? Well, I would say this, when I hear questions phrased in kind of a negative, like does direct mail really still work? My, my spidey senses go to saying, Pardon my French, shitty marketing in any type doesn't work. Say if you again. have bad, shitty marketing of any type doesn't work. So if you have bad direct mail, it's not going to work. If you have bad internet, it's not going to work. If you have bad social media, if you have terrible billboards, if you have horrible raps, if you have horrible employees, it's not going to work. I think what Lou has done an, an awesome job, besides singing, he's made a really good point <laughs> as far as direct mail. I think most less thoughtful business people kind of delegated away where you've got to look at, I have a direct mail strategy for this. I have another one for that. I have pieces and messages that all matter. I'm not a fisherman. What I would say is if I want to catch a certain kind of a fish, I got to use a certain kind of a bait. And so good direct mail works phenomenally, but it's not easy. You have to put thought and strategy into it. And most people, I think Mackenzie was making this point before, and I would agree with Lou that I'm not a marketer. Most people put more time and energy into how to install a furnace, what brand and features the air conditioner has and all this kind of stuff. And then they put the least amount of thought into their own brand. They put the least amount of thought into their own reasons why. And I would do an exercise with fellow contractors before back in the days of the yellow pages and two old timers like Lou and what yellow pages actually are the book used to come. We would take a stack of yellow pages with my teams and I would say, okay, let's make on the board all the things that make us great. And we make a long list, David. Then I'd go hand out yellow pages and go, okay, anything that's in any other ad in the yellow pages, we got to cross it off because it's not us. 
most of the times they had a hard time deciding what really was different. We didn't put as much thought into that as to how we braze the pipe, how we install the water heater, how we did a technical thing. So crappy marketing doesn't work in any place. We want yeah. evidence. The Super Bowl had the crappiest ads in the history of Super Bowl ads. They were the most boring, uninspiring things. And that's, you saw everybody posting, like, let's go back to this other time. No medium is immune to crappy messages. Yeah. yeah. Drew, what are your thoughts on this? You have kind of a, a different view. What are your thoughts? Dave, 98% of people who get mail, who you send mail to, have to touch it. They have to feel it. No other medium does that. It's impossible. Let's look at the behemoths of our, the, the Renewal by Andersons, the Planet Fitnesses, the True Greens, the Terminexes, the, the McDonald's, the Coca-Colas. Nate, give me a, and this is a game that we love to play at work, like, give me a product that's synonymous with, like, a brand that's synonymous with the product. Like, it's not petroleum jelly. It's not Vaseline. It's petroleum jelly. People, it's not FedEx, it's overnight. My question to you is, and I believe in layers, is this digital work? People fishing in the same pond for the same leads, and you have the agencies who aren't selling direct mail because it's completely non-transparent. You don't know what you're buying. 70% of millennials prefer direct mail over any other form of advertising. The, the mailbox, which used to have 50 to 60 pieces in it, now have six or seven pieces in it. You can own a mailbox. You get an email after six, if, if I get on a phone call, by the time I'm done with the phone call, that email's lost. It's it's 65 deep and it's no, it, it's lost. You're paying for ads that are playing in the background. Like when you scroll down on the Yahoo page and yeah. that, that video loads up, like that doesn't load up until you get down to the next ad. That's the view. Yeah. When, when somebody types in the name Griffin Services into Google, that's a pay-per-click. That's, I mean, like, how is that a pay-per-click? That was brought in by outside exterior force. That was brought in by his trucks, by his yard signs, by his radius mailers, by his direct mail, by referrals, by word of mouth, however it is. That's not a digital lead. I, I, I ask anybody in the audience, go to your phone right now, go to Google and type in roofer near me, HVAC near me. The first page is going to be LSA, which is now on a bidding system. The second page is going to be a map. The third page is going to be home advisors, Angie's List, Yelp, like all investing in another, taking your money and investing in another product that's not your brand. Like if you're going to go into business, invest in yourself, invest in your brand, get your ROI today, plant the seeds, like all our predecessors, like the companies that I named before, plant the seeds so that you're going to get your business today. But you're also going to get your business for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right now, you're we're taking in all industries, we're taking non-instant gratification and we're turning it into instant gratification. And it's so hard right now because most of the people who come to me, they don't even know how to wean off of it because they they have so many employees and they're losing money on it. They're, they actually are spending so much money. There's people spending 40, 50,000, 60,000 dollars a month on pay-per-click and they're losing money they're afraid to let it go because they're afraid that they're not going to be able to feed the beast before i turn it over to you drew i picked up in your meeting yesterday in the mastermind you invited me to you have a very loving reference to pay-per-click you call it something a little bit different what is that i call it paper crack you get the first drugs for free then you pay after that i think what andrew's saying is very valid and and what i would say it is think about it's easier for a business owner to subrogate out responsibility for marketing to a third party, like a home advisor or an Angie's list, or even pay per click. All you do is bid. He doesn't have to think very much because he doesn't have to be creative. He doesn't have to be thoughtful. And a really important thing about mailbox right now is with some of the COVID times and other things, the mailbox is dwindling. One of the first things people are pulling out of marketing is the harder to be successful and think and spend more time thoughtfully in your messaging, which is direct mail. So they pull it out. So more and more, the better your marketing presence in the mailbox is, the more chance it has of being seen, the less chance it has of being junk mail and thrown away. And I've seen, and thanks somebody put in the, in the comments, big companies are starting to go back to really expensive direct mail for a reason. Like, well, how are we going to reinvent it as a little guy? Let's follow the auto manufacturers. Let's follow the national retailers. They know things before we know them. And so who's the biggest direct mailer in the world? I, I wouldn't have a guess at that. Google. Mic drop. It's the biggest direct mailer in the world. So, I mean, it's, 
They believe in it. I mean, it's it's like, Tommy, if your tech wants to quit tomorrow, and what's the barrier to entry to putting up a, for him to put up an ad on pay-per-click and sell a product 25% cheaper than you and go on his own or, or do business on the side? Like what the brand, I think that's what gets overlooked so much is what what is the brand that you're building that is going to like you own a mailbox you own a home like lou says you have a brand like you have commitment from people and there is a barrier to entry if you hit a mailbox six times in a row good luck trying to mail into the same mailboxes that tom and lou are mailing into you're just gonna you're gonna fail miserably because Hmm. they own that mailbox they own that home well during the election season they didn't shy away from mailing those are the biggest boldest most frequent postcards you got because they don't work, they mailed them because mm. they had nothing better to spend their money on. I mean, they know it works. Right. People at a very high level understand how to influence the message. Now, they didn't just do mail. Right. They had radio ads and TV ads and online. And mail was a component to integrate that message. Right. Lou, do you want to add something onto that? Yeah. So, Dave, I want you to bring up a slide that will tie well into this. It was a cartoon 15 years ago today. Sign letters, mail. Yeah. Right today. So that ties directly into what we're talking about right here. I mean, 15, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, if you got an email, it was like, wow, I got an email. There wasn't any electronic email, digital type marketing. Everything was through the mail. Now, today, direct mail is that different piece of marketing, it's that memorable piece of marketing. So, for me, prospectively in my business, my largest and most profitable customer segment is between 50 and 75. That's my largest, most profitable customer segment. These are individuals that they're doing pretty well in life. They probably own their home. They have a lot of equity and they want to be comfortable. And that encompasses a lot of baby boomers and a lot of retired individuals. So for a lot of retired individuals, the mailbox visit and going through the mail is like their biggest event of the day. They have money. They want to be comfortable, right? They're stuck at home, especially during COVID. So we're here to be able to serve them. And that direct mail is very memorable. It sticks around for a while, especially if you use offers to get them to keep them around. It's an average shelf life of 17 days. And there's no other medium that that has that. The, the, The key that I've learned from my clients from these Zoom groups and from is that it's the message. It's not offering what you want to sell people. It's finding out what the problem is and offering them a solution to that problem. One of the conversations we've recently had is how do you get somebody to react in when there's no catalyst, when it's January and it's February and the weather is moderate or, or like it's, that's not what it's about. It's about branding yourself so that when the matter, when the catalyst does come, they're calling you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Who doesn't have a direct mail drawer? I mean, I don't know anyone in my life that doesn't get mail pieces and know that hmm, in a month from now, I'm going to need that or I'm, and they take that and they put it in their drawer. I tell you one quick story, Mackenzie. I have a tree guy who's in Connecticut who mails 250,000 pieces 10 times a year to the same exact homes. He's been doing it year after year after year. When the storm hit up two years ago in May and Connecticut got demolished, he didn't have a mail piece out. He doesn't do any digital marketing and 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 I believe in layers. I, I do believe in layers i believe everything makes everything work better and nobody can ever tell you where like i said where a lead actually comes from because what touch point actually makes that lead trigger he got over 2500 calls from this storm people going to google typing in his name and calling him without a card in front of him it's just like what what tom was saying like you go into a, a home and you ask the person well who you can name if i if i call 250 250,000 people the only person that they knew of was kane j trick he's branded himself so well that they don't know of anybody else lou you want to add you something know? there yeah i did i just wanted to follow up on mckenzie so she makes a really great point whether it's a direct mail drawer it's a file so let's put this in perspective all of us that own homes have had projects that we're planning on getting accomplished in our home or a future need that we know is going to happen so at that point kind of like the car effect when you're shopping for a new car or thinking about a new car all of a sudden you start seeing them everywhere and before that you never saw them right. direct mail is no different if you're planning on a future project or summer's around the corner and your hvac is getting old or your neighbors have had their sewer replaced and you're in the same age and you have an electrical panel whatever it is you're going to see these direct mail pieces if they're memorable they're different they have offers and you're going to save them in that direct mail drawer so when your need does come 
I do the same thing. When your need comes, you're going to go to that file, that drawer, that compilation that you've collected, and you're going to go through, and that's the ones that are going to get the opportunities. Lou, our community here loves specific examples, and uh, I want you, first Lou and then Tom, to give one here, one specific format, postcard piece, or offer that you've recently used that's a little bit different, that's maybe a little bit that stands out for some reason that uh, you think exemplifies your creativity and your spirit around trying new things and being uh, on the leading edge. So let me start with you, Lou. What's one example of something that that recently worked that's kind of your favorite that stands out in your mind? All right. So listen carefully, because I'm going to give you some serious gold here. This isn't something that can be done all the time, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. So Tom was actually in Phoenix, maybe be September, October timeframe for a conference. And he sat down, we visited and Tom and I have known each other for 30 years. Anyway, so we sat down, we were trying to just brainstorm some different direct mail pieces. And uh, we came up with an idea that, okay, we all have credit cards, right? And when you apply for a new card, the new card comes in the mail or your replacement card comes in the mail. How does it come? It comes in a non-descriptive blank white envelope with no return address. And you pick it up, you look at it, you're not sure what it is. So it goes left hand, right hand, trash cans over there. That's the save. You feel it, you feel something hard inside. Okay, it's worthwhile, at least looking might be a credit card. So you have to save it. So everything else goes in the trash. You carry your save pile into your kitchen, your counter, your desk, wherever you're going to open your mail up. You open that up. So basically we designed a piece and I used it as a closeout special for 2020. I launched it just after election. So I had about six weeks to the year end for a closeout special of HVAC equipment. And uh, what I did is we took a blank white envelope, right? No return address. And we stuck a letter. So a letter offer folded, tri-folded. And on the outside, we put a hard plastic credit card-like feel, look-alike card on the outside with a short description, very obvious what it was, this offer, this closeout special. So basically our whole goal was to get it opened, right? So they don't know what it is. It's a credit card. They're going to open it, immediately open it. They see this closeout special. So if they ever had any thought, idea, inclination, that their HVAC may be in its last leg. They've gotten quotes to replace it before. Everybody else has got it done in their neighborhood. They know they should do it. Their electric bills are getting high. They're afraid it may go out. They've had large repairs, whatever the case is, they're going to look at it. So I would say it got in the 90 to 100. If it was in their hands, I guarantee it. 99% open rate. From that piece, that closeout special, that brought me in over $500,000 in sales just from that piece. Now, December in Phoenix, Arizona, not a great month for me. I'm about an $11 million service retrofit company. And December, people in Phoenix have better things to do with their money coming into the holidays and Christmas, and it's not really cold here. So we had a record-breaking $1.1 million December, and December is usually kind of crappy. That was an excellent December for us, and it was really due to that piece, that credit card, fake credit card, look, feel, touch, seems like, open it up, a really nice offer, everybody likes a deal, and we just really blew that one up. Wow, what a great example, folks. Over at Zoom and uh, Facebook, drop an X if you just got some value out of Lou's example there. Lou and Tom called me up and on a Zoom call where we had 50 other clients and they said, Andrew, this is what we're doing for December. So I had to go out and get all the machines. I put the tabbers and it's amazing. It's incredible to be a part of something to, it's like to, I keep saying the word ecosystem. It just doesn't do it justice. Like we are a family, our clients are a family and there's, we don't take on clients that we don't like and our clients like each other and they, they all come together. And it's amazing to, to watch one and one idea morph on a call where where everybody's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh my God, I haven't thought of that. Or I've been, I'm having trouble with this and I'm having trouble with this and, and the ideas that come through. And, and that's why, that's why every month we're doing something different because it's, it's not like, we're not a direct mail house. We don't, somebody wants to call up and buy 50,000 postcards and do it one time. Let me give you somebody else's number. We're a model where we say, we're going to, we're going to do this data and analytics for you. We're going to mail to your prospects every month. We're going to mail to your existing clients every month. We're going to mail radius mailers. We're going to pull them weekly. We're going to send thank you cards at the end each month. And we're going to provide the materials like Lou was talking about, like those referral cards that he gives out and Tom gives out that says to your client, here's a $50 referral 
tarot card, give it to a friend, a family, or a coworker, and write your name on the back of it. And if it works, we'll send you $50. And that's the cheapest way that you're ever going to acquire an account. You don't get what you don't ask for. We, we, we sell yard signs at, at $5. We sell four mil vinyl stickers that are UV coated and weatherproof. We might sell them in lots of 5,000 instead of Tom came to me and said, here, I'm about to buy a, I'm about to buy a thousand. He's at 90 cents each. I'm like, well, I can't, let me see what I can do. And I came back to him. I was like, I can't do a thousand and 90 cents. I can do 5,000 for 20 cents. So Tom, let me ask you that question. And I see so many questions still coming in for you, for you gentlemen, really appreciate you staying here. I and mean, I appreciate everybody in the community and the audience uh, sticking around. They're getting a lot of value. Tom, I want to know from you we just heard a really cool example from lou that you always try to one-up him right so let's hear it what do you got I'd rather collaborate with them than one up. So what I what I believe in marketing and, and lose the card we did was a good example of it. And it goes to some of the earlier questions about junk mail and does it really work? People are busier than ever. They're being bombarded by more of every type of message than ever. So I believe that entertainment is the currency with which we can buy someone's attention, even for like two or three seconds. So the feel of that card, knowing, oh boy, I don't remember ordering a credit card, that gets that pause to set it aside. Our most successful pieces, there was one you showed that had a baby with the, uh, oh shit, the shit was like kind of symbols. That people stop on that mail because the baby has a different look, the, the headline is different. And so I feel like when the one we did with no BS worked very well, something that just can break the monotony of the things they're hearing and seeing make a piece more successful. What I don't think makes a piece successful is pictures of windows and air conditioners and water heaters and trucks and real crappy pictures of you like the owner, like looking all cheesy and stuff. You have to, if you're going <laughs> to use images, they need to be good images. So we, we looked at some the other day and I was, Andrew looped me in and said, Hey, can you take a look at this? Cause he always will say, can you help one of my other customers? And, and we do in this ecosystem, as he puts it, I'll jump on the phone with any of his people and try to do my best as a peer to help them out. I said, they're using images of themselves and they don't look very happy. Right. Like the people seeing this ad thing, these are some miserable mofos, man. These are not happy people. <laughs> and so that's what I would say. The, the, the imagery and the headlines and the messaging has to be entertaining enough or distracting enough to break the routine because we just go through life and don't even pay attention. So um, I, I want to pick up on something there that you, you shared yesterday in the mastermind and, and, it, and it involved you rolling up your sleeves and showing us your tattoos. Tell us about that a little bit and how you perceive the need for real photos versus stock photography as it pertains to what you're communicating out there to your market. Yeah, we we're saying last night, people asked what's like one thing you could do. And I said, invest in professional photography. It's 500 bucks. Get your people, have a photographer, photographer follow your team around for a day and take pictures of your men doing the things you want to promote. And you can, you can leverage those in other ways, digitally and stuff. You don't want to be promoting your service and be talking about why you like a Habike and then using some generic Google picture that 1500 other contractors use. You want a Habika technician in that picture. You as an owner, if you're going to be in it, don't be all, don't be who you're not. I've seen Lou's stuff and him and his brothers I've known for a long time. When you see a picture, that's, if you ran into him in the restaurant, those are the guys you're going to see. I did say with tattoos and stuff, I don't hide that. That's if you're going to be unhappy that I have tattoos, then you're going to be unhappy when my people show up at your, your house. So I think that's kind of the entertainment value of things or, or and not like entertainment, like tell a joke or whatever, something that just gets a pause or a break in the thinking. And each person's different. I mean, each, each company, what I do, Griffin, Lou cannot out Griffin Griffin and I can't Habika Habika. Mm. So finding your DNA of what is your true thing mm -hmm. and then making it purple unicorn, making it the black sheep and all the white sheep that it stands out, that will break the attention enough. And that's it's, it's definitely in the mail. If you're integrating that it's also in social media and it's also in your website and it's also other places, something as stupid as 80 or 90% of all trucks and logos in the HVAC industry are dominated by red and blue. So start a new company and make a red and blue company. It's going to stand out like crazy. Like, why don't you make a pink and purple truck that no one else has? Right. That's the difference in, I think, getting people's attention in the most successful campaigns. I want to do for a moment, folks, let me transition to uh, getting to your questions here, your real-time questions. And I want to do that by giving you an opportunity. If you want to learn more specifically about what Drew can help your business achieve, if you're a 
residential service provider, contractor. If you aspire to be like Tom and Lou, I want to give you an opportunity to find out more and get more details from these folks. Or if you want to learn more about how to employ these kinds of direct mail campaigns and use digital technology to support them in the ways that we've described, I want to give you an opportunity to find out find out more about that. So here's how we can, we've set aside time with our team, with Drew and Lou and Tom have also been very gracious to speak to you. If you need help, if you want to learn how to use a direct mail in the way that Drew and Tom and Lou have talked about, we want to give you a way to actually talk to us one-on-one -on -one about that. There's a lot of different types of companies here. And so depending on what your need is and uh, what your objectives are, like Mackenzie said, and like Tom echoed, we want to reverse engineer back from where your problem is to help you take that next step. There's no obligation, of course. If you want to sign up for an opportunity uh, to talk to us, there's a URL there on the screen. Mackenzie, Suzanne, and Jessica are also going to throw it into the various chats um, wherever you are in Zoom, LinkedIn, and Facebook. What you do when you go there, it's a little form you can fill out, first name, last name, email, and then there's a little box where you can type in what you're interested in. Let us know what kind of help you think you might need, whether it be something that Drew can provide. Maybe you want to get input from Tom or Lou, and what we are going to do is direct the questions to the right folks, and if a one-on-one -on -one call would be something that's useful to you, we'd be happy to, um, happy to arrange that. So who is this for? If, like I said, you're a contractor, residential service provider, and you want to find out more, maybe get Drew's help in looking at, hey, is this something that would help my business? Then let's set up a time to talk. If you happen to be a printer or an agency or a marketing services company in the audience, you're part of our community, and you want to learn more about how to use direct mail and perhaps the ways that Drew is describing and, and what you're hearing from the panel today, we can help you with that. All right. So if you want that help, McKinsey is going to drop that URL in under the into the chats and Suzanne and Jessica will do the same. And like I said, the purpose of the call is just to get clear at what your goals are and see what specific steps you can take to get where you want to be, depending on what your objectives are. So when you go to that URL, um, this is what you're going to see. There's a little form. It is uh, on MindFire's website. But like I said, we will be routing based on whatever that you think you need, whatever help it is that you're looking for. Drew, Tom, and Lou have all been very gracious and are obviously willing to help, as are we here at MindFire. So we'd love to talk to you if that's something that would be useful to you. Mackenzie, just confirm you've thrown that into the chat. Okay, looks like you have. Okay, good. And Jessica and Suzanne will do the same as well. And what I want to do now in the time that we have left, man, we, we have still a lot of people here. I want to take some real-time questions for Lou, Tom, or, or uh, Drew. And so let's do this. Mackenzie, over from Zoom, since you've been in Zoom, give me a question and let's address that to one of the three gentlemen here on the panel. What, what do you see that stands out to you? Yeah, so a big one that a lot of people want to know about is tracking ROI on direct mail, especially if, as an example, they go to Google after they see the postcard and call your company. Go ahead, Tom. This is a kind of a pet peeve of mine. So I think today with Google being the great equalizer, tracking a campaign, a specific campaign, as much as you'd like to ideally say there are, and I will say we have a tracking number on every piece we do to see something. What we've learned in scaling rapidly in Florida was to track the total calls. Do I care, honestly, if I have a budget and I'm living within it and I have a required number of leads and I'm achieving them? The mixture changes. If I went back, like I did a direct mail thing and Andrew knows this, I said, okay, let's look at the direct, how many people call the number on the piece of mail? And it wasn't the numbers we expected. I also went and looked at my call reports and saw that for six days, my call volume was 25% plus higher when the mail hit the mailbox. Also my online submissions or my Google phone number was higher. So was it actually that they didn't call on the piece because it was the only marketing going or just coincidentally Google was better that week and it happened month after month after month. So I think the ROI question for me, I would ask everybody to maybe think about it differently than just the specific thing and look at it as a holistic ROI. Are you staying within your total budget? Are you generating the calls? And if you're not, then you start to get into the weeds and say, what thing is it working? What messaging is it right? Also, listen to the phone calls on all the tracking numbers and hear what they say. 
They call a Google phone number and they say these magic words to Andrew's ears. I got your postcard. Is that a Google lead or is that a postcard lead? Because Google's phone number is certainly taking damn credit for it. That's just one perspective, but it's definitely how we operate. I just saw someone drop the word genius there in the chat. So they, I think they appreciate your response there. Thank you for that, that insight and that gold. Jessica and Suzanne, drop me in the back channel here in Ring Central. Any questions that you're pulling out of those social channels? I see a number of people asking, hey, sorry, I have to leave early. Uh, Thomas is saying, hey, it's 7 p.m. for me here. And others are asking, how do I get the recording of this? I want to share it with my team. So folks, yes, it's being recorded. Uh, we will follow up and get the recording to all of you, and it will be available on the web as as well. Mackenzie, what would you say the next question is that you've seen come come through Zoom that seems to be prevalent? So yeah, we got a lot of questions about this regarding current USPS delays with mail. Oh. Does that affect into your strategy? Do you think about that? There have been delays and everything with COVID and the elections didn't help and the runoff didn't help. And I think things are getting a little bit better with employees being out. It's a challenge for a direct mail marketing company, especially like someone like ourselves to put out hundreds of millions of pieces per year that that we do everything that we can where we we were a certified postal agency and it's being the mail's being approved and it's going out FedEx and being drop shipped to the locations and then sometimes it, it might sit in the post office for a week at the end of the day it's like a diet it's not about the day it's not about the week it's not about the month it's about the year so if you mail 12 times a year and and, and you do the right type of mailing like we never really came up Tom and Lou will tell you that 75% of their business comes from their existing clients. I'm saying that's why at the beginning I said like existing client mailers are so important. At the end of the day, if you go to people 12 times a year, you're when they need their system, when they need their plumbing, when they need their roof done, when they need their when they need to lose weight, when they need to go to a gym, when they need they're gonna call you. So I think yes, we, we would love for everything to be timed perfectly. It's a year. Yeah, that's what I based on what you guys have all said, it's very clear that it's not about the one mailer, right? It's a consistent effort over time. And if one piece is late, you're you're hitting them consistently, right? You're you're not because you're setting yourself up for the future by doing your marketing on a consistent basis, that one piece, if it's a little bit late, isn't detrimental. Kind of going back to your example about the gym, Andrew, right? If you're consistently on a plan for the entire year and you go on holiday for five days, those five days on holiday, when you eat and drink and do whatever you do, are not going to affect the entire year's work if you put in that work throughout the whole year. They do if that five days a year is the only time that you're putting work in. Folks, if you want help, and I see Scott has already got a time on the calendar here and Angela has done the same and a few others as well. If you want to talk to Drew, if you want to figure out how the unique way that Drew and his company are using direct mail and if it can help you, like I said, as a contractor, service provider, servicing residents, servicing consumers the way Tom and Lou are doing, McKenzie's going to drop that URL again in the chat. These, these folks have been very gracious with their time, not only today, but also going forward and take advantage of that. If this is something you think can help you, go to that URL, Facebook, LinkedIn, Zoom, it's going to be in all of those places. And uh, we'd love to talk to you about how we can help you with that. Uh, Tom, I'll get to you in just one sec. The other thing is if you're a, a printer, if you're an agency in our community and you want to understand uh, some of the innovative ways that direct mail is being used today and you're wondering, hey, is this a, a value-added service that I can start to offer my clients using modern mechanisms to support that direct mail? We'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. Grab a time, fill in the form, let us know what your issue is, what it is that you're trying to solve, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Tom, go ahead. Take back off, Mackenzie and Andrew, with mail delays. I think for most of home services, these are grudge purchases. Mm. They're not like super sexy. I want to buy an AC. I want to buy a furnace. I want to buy a water heater. I need a sewer line. Even things like air filtration and water filtration are not desirable, sexy purchases. They're grudge purchases. And so the goal of marketing is not to be in the mailbox or in the hand the day the water heater breaks, because that's a very long shot bet. The goal of marketing is to be the company they think of first and they trust the most whenever that day comes. So the mail being three days this way or five days that way is not affecting the, the, the moment of truth to make that decision because that's such a long shot. It's just consistently saying, these are the guys, the Habika guys. I seen them. I like them. I see them in the neighborhood. And the oh crap day comes. And then they, that's the zero moment of truth for you. So the timing of the mail may have more to do if you're a retailer and you're having a Valentine's Day sale or it's the Black Friday or whatever. It's home services. It's a consistently 
communicating that you're the guy and the one they can trust. Yep, makes sense. Lou, do you agree with that? Is that how you see things? And is, is that how you, from, from your vantage point, look over yeah. your marketing and how you're engaging your clients? Yeah, 100%. Be memorable, communicate your brand and the way you want to be remembered. And they will save it in their drawer, their pile. And that time comes, you're going to be the vetted guy, even though they may not have used you before. The proof of everything that they've built with your reputation and thought and what you're presenting and your why, they're going to go to you and you're going to get that opportunity. And all we're looking for is opportunities. We have an opportunity. We do all with those. Sometimes you reach out to your clients per year. So if you're a brand new, well, if you're an existing client of mine, you will hear from us 60 to 70 times every year. We That's don't amazing. go away unless you ask us to go. One thing I can promise is we are the most likable people you'll ever meet. Andrew? I was saying like, it's not just direct mail. I mean, it's, you're once a month, that's less than five bucks a year. You're, what are your other mechanisms? You're hitting a phone call, you're sending an email, you're, that's 30 seconds. So where are you getting the other 34 or 24 kids in that? Yeah, so Lou, people are saying, tell us again, how many times you're mailing? One more so time. Not mailing, this is touching. I mean, we have email, we have yard signs, we have billboards in and out of the neighborhood, the zip codes that we want to own. We have radius mailers, we have thank you cards with gift cards. We tag the entire home with emergency shutoff valve tags on all the emergency shutoff valves with a $50 coupon on any service moving forward. We sticker all the equipment. We have six different leave behind promo items that are highly valued and sought after and used by homeowners that are tied to every service we offer. So just staying aware, keeping top of mind in the home. So the next time they have a need, they're going to think of, I'll throw it your way, Tom. They're going to think of Griffin Service. Griffin, yeah. I see folks over in LinkedIn saying, wow, I really have to talk to Andrew. So uh, Jessica or Suzanne, whoever's in LinkedIn, make sure folks have that URL. I think that was John who said that. John on, go to that a form, fill that in. Let us know specifically what you're thinking, and we'll make sure you get connected with with Andrew. I see Jessica said that in response to your your comment, Tom, about seeing how many calls you're getting on your direct mail, folks are asking, do you use a specific phone number, a trackable phone number on those direct mail pieces? We do. So like I say, we do track. And maybe it's because it's been around so long, there was a point in time you couldn't see all these fancy dashboards. You had to rely on phone tracking. We track every referral card. Every employee's got their own number that we track how well they refer. Every mail piece has a, a, a tracking number. So we know all of best phone calls. We know we, we went away from like special numbers on our trucks and things because those are our branded number so we probably have oh gosh Lou we probably have 30 or 40 tracking numbers so we do look at that we also look to see like back to the mail delay I'm more going to ask Andrew's team what's the mailbox date of that mail because I want to see my overall call count go so every morning in my team huddle I find out how many phone calls how many conversions how many aged appointments we know our our score every day so if a mailbox's date is Tuesday, I'm going to expect a phone increase and I'm going to see and I'm going to go from this many hundred calls to this many calls today for how many days and then I'll, I'll see it drop off potentially after those five or six days. Today alone, David, I had two calls off of November offer last year for huh. free camera inspection to the point where the, the, the dispatchers were like, do we have an offer going again for a camera inspection? <laughs> and we have a board of all, I'm like, no, that was that was before Thanksgiving. So November, December, January, February, four months later, they're calling for a sewer problem. And oh, by the way, I'd like the free camera. Yep. So tracking number is the same for all that. So I don't know if that answers the question exactly. We have many tracking numbers. We do try to sort and sift. We're going to back it all up to the total incoming calls. I have a question for everybody is who's still here. So Dave, at that? the end of the day, the everything, the tracking are irrelevant. At the end of the day, Google is a toll booth. And we have to accept that every single lead is going to go through Google and that unless you're going to go and, and do an audit of your Google and find that how many people put your actual name into the box that more and more that it's going to happen. We did a holdout test for that national chain. We didn't believe that people were going to come in with their postcards and they, they 
they they're running the same law firms we did we did a whole death test where we met the homes number 111 21 31 41 51 61 70 we held those out but the person mailed um, a million pieces 500,000 pieces and we held out 90,000 pieces the then we went back afterwards we took the the, the signups we matched them back to the type of signups that they were and it was a 47 percent net lift of people who received mail who didn't receive mail after paying for the cost of mail so, i mean it's like, is anybody to come in with a television, to come in with a radio? It's all going to go through the internet. And so all I can say about call tracking is that it's good for you to know just to feel that your phone's ringing. At the end of the day, we'll give you their ways to do matchback reports that we can show you relevantly when a piece went out and when someone called. Talking about that November piece, um, I had a client who ran in 2018 in September and he put out 25,000 pieces and he was supposed to put out 25,000 pieces three times and he only put it out once and he quit and he said he got no calls and when I saw his call tracking, he needed 29 calls, good or bad, who knows. I was going through call tracking three months ago and I went and I, I came across that account, I was just curious and he still got this year he still got 10 calls it was for that 29 calls it was up to 104 calls so over two years he picked up you know after that after the first three months the the next 19 months he picked up another 75 calls over the next 19 months from that piece wow wow i, I have a question drew for everybody in the audience actually i want to ask all of you here that are still uh, with us and thank you for still being here and participating i see jill and scott and angela and larry and a number of you are asking for time on the calendars and uh, we'd love to be able to talk to you one-on-one -on -one. Uh, that url is in the chat and was on the screen a second ago here's my question for all of you what was the what was the thing that you heard today that maybe tom said that lou said drew said maybe mckenzie that unlocks some value for you something that you hadn't considered before something that maybe you had forgotten about uh, something new that you heard today take a moment give us that gift of your feedback drop it into the chat whether that is in zoom in linkedin or in facebook we want to hear uh, what that is for you and i see mckenzie that you mentioned let's see gail was asking a specific question as you're thinking about what the value was and dropping that into the chat mckenzie what was the question that gail had yeah so gail was asking some questions about high end how you use direct mail for high-end. So not things like HVAC. If you're doing uh, a custom remodel or a high-end remodel, luxury remodel, how are you leveraging direct mail to focus on that market segment? So it's targeting, it's putting out the correct piece, it's putting the right message. You know, the days of splash and spray are over, and that's what I was trying to get to. We, we show you who you're, when we, we find out who your exact client is, and then we find out profile clients who are similar to those clients so that we can not waste the money on going after apartments and condos or car routes that don't meet those specifications. You want, you want to put a gloss on it, you want to put a UV on it, you want to not put coupons on it. It's branding. It's branding. And there's really no other medium out there that brands. I mean, obviously there's billboards and billboards are great. Television and radio are fantastic for brands. Look at the relevancy of television and radio and how over the years through Netflix and DVR and streaming and casting that it's just it's not as relevant as it once was. So targeting, finding your exact client, finding the correct piece and giving the correct message. Folks are uh, responding with here in terms of what was a value to them. I think it's always interesting to hear what stands out. And uh, one of them was the stat that you shared, Drew. I think it was you. Around 70% of millennials preferring direct mail. Art said that despite the specific method of outre outreach, most people go to Google before they call. And so that that that's some interesting uh, perspective there. I think Mark raises an interesting point here saying, I never thought of HVAC as being a grudge purchase previously. It is true. And that changes the way I will look at my future marketing. Also, I like tracking service calls per day. And that's an interesting, interesting stat as well. I see Angela saying, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for sharing the link. Uh, so, so great feedback there, folks. Thank you for that. If anything else jumped out at you today for Lou, for Tom, for Drew, please let us know. 
know. And before you leave, please give us give those guys a little love. Go into the chat, whether it's in Zoom or in LinkedIn or in Facebook. Drop some X's uh, to show them some some love there. If you got value from what they shared, we appreciate them being so freely giving of their insights and their experiences. I see Brett dropping some love there for Lou, Tom, and Drew. Keep those coming in. Ed says the same. I see Ashley doing it as well. Thank you for that. I see John and Ed have booked some time uh, to talk further about this. Thank you, folks, for that. We really appreciate it. Jennifer says, you were all fantastic. Lou, Tom, and Drew, thank you for sharing your insights. Mark says, this has been a great presentation. Thank you. Wayne says, Dave and McKenzie, this is the best you have ever done. Well, it was Tom, Lou, and Drew, not Dave and McKenzie. Thank you for that. That's we humbling. You knocked it out of the park. The three <laughs> guests were great. Thank you to all. Jim says, thank you. Mark says, great session. Thank you for all the insights. Randall says, thank you for this. For those of you who are new here today, I hope you come back to an upcoming session. We'll certainly have Drew back on the show and, and uh, Lou will probably come and sing something longer for us in one of his upcoming appearances here. And maybe Tom, what do you do, Tom? Do you have any special uh, talents outside of growing businesses? The show is the singing. It's definitely not singing. That's for sure. <laughs> Here's a good question from Don saying, hey, are any of you using QR codes to help drive prospects to a landing page or your website? Lou or Tom, No. Drew, are you seeing that in any of your customers? Not as much as there was a there was a period of time where it was all the rage putting QR codes. I just it, technology everything's at your fingertips at all times. It's just as easy to get to the website any other way with your phone, with your with your tablet. So I haven't I don't get a lot of people requesting QR codes. I see Paul saying, "Wow, touching customers sixty times a month." Or that was Paula, I think, said that sixty times a month. Wow, I'm going to do a that year. now. Yeah, that was a year, right? Yeah. yeah. Paula, go for it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> if you want to talk further, Paula, Don, Gail, I see all of you here still. I see many, many people here. I'm going to throw the URL up on the screen one more time, mindfiremarketing.com forward slash yes. That is a Mindfire URL. As I mentioned to you, if you want time with Drew at the best postcards, if you want insight from Tom and Lou, go over there, fill in that form, let us know what's on your mind, what you need, and how we can help. Mackenzie, if you don't mind drop that into the chat one more time you've done it numerous times already thank you for doing that and same for jessica and suzanne over where uh, wherever you are on socials let's get that in there Thank you for that. Dar says, this was a really excellent session. Kirk says, thank you for your time. Jim says, the biggest takeaway for me is that direct mail does work. Fantastic. That is a that is a significant takeaway and certainly what we were hoping to accomplish. Well, look, folks, we've gone over the allotted time today. And so I don't want to hold Lou, Tom, and Drew any longer than necessary. If you've got a question, I'm going to wait another few seconds. If you have any other questions, Mackenzie, do you see anything else that's jumping out? I mean, we had tons of questions, so I'm sure we didn't get to everything. If you're still here and you've got a burning question, now's your time to ask. Mackenzie, did we miss anything here that you think yes. we should take? So, yeah, we have one last one, which is so regarding the 60 to 70 touch points per year that you invest in marketing to your customers, about how much does that work out in cost, cost per year? So how much are you spending on those touches to market to your customers? Maybe it's a percent or a dollar amount, something like that. Eight to 10%. There you go. Love it. The other thing is a lot of people are asking for information. They, they loved the matchback report, the ROI. I think people were pretty shocked that you can get it down to that level. Mm. So everyone out there, if you want to see more of those, if you want Andrew to walk you through one of those and explain to you all the details, someone actually specifically asked, can I zoom in and see it? So we're going to be sending out the recording. Andrew has tons of them and he'd be happy to walk you through them and show how you can. You can can see, if there's anybody who wants to know a little bit about their business, there's no, we don't, we don't require that to go through like send us your customer list and we'll have a data analyst get on the phone with you and do a matchback and do not do a matchback but show you a little bit about your business we've done okay for ourselves now's our time to to help people and if, if we can educate you at all about your business and there's no commitment if you want to if you want to know a little bit more about your customers and stuff like that we're happy to we're happy to do it for you you can go over to that link mindfiremarketing.com slash yes and just say that hey Hey, I, I want that that awesome offer that Andrew just gave to give me some insight on my business and my customers. So he's just agreed to sort of to do that for you. As he said, let's let's work together as a group. You want that? Anybody wants your help. Anybody wants your help. For the folks over in LinkedIn and on the Facebook, if you want a recording of this session, uh, drop the word recording there in the chat. So whether you're in LinkedIn or in Facebook, and our team will go back through that and message you the link when it's ready. So go drop the word recording over in Facebook 
Facebook or in uh, LinkedIn. For everyone else who signed up through Zoom, when you signed up for the event today, you will also receive that here in a few hours. You'll get a link to a page with the recording, the examples that were shown today, the slides, and some other special um, assets that I think you'll find very, very valuable. So all of you who signed up through Zoom will get that. If you're in Facebook or LinkedIn, just drop the word recording. I see John, Eileen, I see Tamara, I see Jill, all asking for it. Drop that in there and uh, the team will follow up and make sure we get that to you. Uh, let's let's do this. Let's go around the table and let's have some, some final words from everybody here. I haven't asked them to prepare for this. I assume they're going to have some wise words. Let's start with you, Lou. I see you're unmuted. What are your parting words for the audience today in, in any manner, business, direct mail, whatever it is that's on your heart and on your mind? Yeah. So if you don't know who you are or how you want to communicate your brand and be remembered, the critical thing here is to be memorable in the way you want to be remembered. That's what it's all about. So figure that out first. And like Tom said, all crappy marketing is going to bring crappy results. So it's crappy marketing. So focus on your brand being memorable. And one thing I can promise is you'll like a Hobike. Thank you, Lou. That's awesome. Tom, what about you? After like 30 years, I'd be sick of that. I love it. I wish I had a, you like a Casey, it would be better maybe. I don't know. I think that if you're, if you want to go someplace you haven't been, the shortest path is probably to find somebody who has. And so in this case, Andrew, I mean, I talk to him and, and I never get off the phone and don't have a nugget of information because I don't know if people get it. I get it. I think Lou gets it is that guy talks to like hundreds of home services. And yeah. so it's a very unique person to, to hear. And sometimes he'll save me from myself because he'll be like, Oh, no, you don't want to do that. Fred over in Oregon did that and it was horrible. And then he'll even connect us. So find somebody who's been there and, and follow them, ask them to guide you would be my takeaway. And I can tell you, Andrew does that. I talk to Lou probably once or twice a week and we have completely different markets and companies. There's always value in that. So find somebody. Beautiful. Drew, what about you? Closing thoughts, advice for the crowd. There are some groups out there. Or obviously, it seems like this has been more focused on home improvement and HVAC. And there are groups out there like Service Nation, Service Alliance, Blue Collar Group, companies that are, are there to give you support next start, that are there to give you support and help you get through it. My biggest nugget that I can say is that it took me 40 years to invest in myself. I always was working for somebody else. I was always the top sales guy making big money wherever I went. And when I say you invest in yourself, that's why I say it's not so much that I want to get down on paper click or Angelist or Home Advisor. Invest in somebody else. You're investing in their brand. Invest in yourself. Invest in your own brand. You are your brand. Like let people know who you are because you're not memorable when you call Angie's list, the plumber walks downstairs and then he walks out and then he's back in the market. When when our clients acquire a client, they don't lose that client because they email them. They, they send them a direct mail piece once a month. They they hit them with, with a phone call, a text message. Like there's no reason to like, I've heard too many war stories of I bought 30,000 leads. I bought 20,000 leads. If you held on to your clients, you wouldn't need to buy 30,000 leads. And you wouldn't need to buy 20,000. You'd have 16,000 leads like these guys do. 16,000 customers who not only can have worked with you before, they trust you, but you can cross sell all your products to them. And they'll come keep coming back to you when they need your service. It's, it's just, it's ingenious. 75% of your business is going to come from your existing clients. Like stop going out and investing in other people's brand, invest in your own brand. Amen. That's the most important thing. It's your brother. Amen. Mackenzie, you're, you're right next to Andrew on my screen here. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an opportunity to closing words, summarize your thoughts, share with the yeah. crowd. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize a few key takeaways that I learned here that I do not want people to miss as they leave this room. I talked to a lot of people and I think that what they see direct mail as is only a top of the funnel customer acquisition strategy. They don't even think about how it is a key component to retaining customers, to getting deeper into customers, to offering things that you, they're going elsewhere for services that you can offer. When you deepen that relationship with your customers, you stay top of mind and you treat them like gold when you do have it going back to the quality, that is a, a great way to continue.
continue to grow your business. So again, direct mail is not only a top of the funnel customer acquisition strategy, it's huge for current customers as well. And the other one that everyone echoed here is own the home, right? How can you provide value to your customers that they may not know about? How can you make their life easier? Tom talked about the grudge purchase and we can talk about the financials. There was a conversation on LinkedIn and if you missed it, go over to LinkedIn and catch the chat conversation. Uh, I was a, a few days ago with us actually and, and Andrew with Joe and j grudge purchases. Yes, there's a financial aspect. When you can help someone make that grudge purchase today, you alleviate their stress. And for me, that to me is worth gold, right? So if Tom or Lou or anyone is mailing me about a grudge purchase that I have to do that I've been putting off, me putting off that grudge purchase is adding to my daily stress. And so yes, you can make it easier for them financially by giving an incentive. You're also adding value by alleviating some stress that no one needs extra stress in their life. So those were my big takeaways from, from all the guys here today. Wonderful. I see folks asking, how do I connect with Drew? How do I connect with Tom? How do I connect with Lou? That's gonna be in the follow-up information, folks. We'll include the LinkedIn profile for each of those gentlemen. Drew, did you have something you wanted to interject there on top of? Yeah. Well, that's like the way I met you, Dave. It was on a LinkedIn post where you posted an article on Jill and Nordstrom's, both reporting earnings on the same day, both falling short of expectations and both CMOs coming on and saying, we underestimated the value of our direct mail and yep. direct mail was the, our catalogs and our direct mail. It was the number one reason for our shortfall. And that's, that's when I honed in and that's when I reached out to you. And I was like, it's you two publicly traded companies on the same day saying the same exact thing. Like just perception is reality. Absolutely. There's, I definitely remember that. And many here in the audience do. I can see if MIGS is still here over on LinkedIn. In fact, I remember talking to Migs about that as well. And that was uh, definitely an impactful moment for many in the industry. Thank you, Drew, for remembering that and bringing that up. I don't think there's anything that I can add that hasn't already been said by McKinsey, by Andrew, by Tom, by Lou. So for the entire community here that's still here with us, drop a thank you there into the chat. Let these folks know, all of them, how grateful you are for their time. If you got value out of this, please drop a comment there in LinkedIn and on Zoom. A thank you to everybody, McKinsey, to Andrew Edinger over at The Best Postcards, Tom Casey, Lou Habaika. Thank you all for your time. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. The community has absolutely loved their time with you and we'll definitely have to have you back on the show soon tom we're going to expect a performance from you you got it it's humbling you got it thank you all for your time everybody who's here have a great rest of the day i hope i see you again next friday we're going to continue doing this and uh, like somebody said in the chat don't forget to get your honey a special valentine's day gift which is a good reminder for me i wrote that down as soon as you said that <laughs> thank you all for your time have a wonderful rest of the day and an incredible weekend thanks everybody Bye bye